one. Um, yeah, welcome and congratulations for getting out in the rain and braving it all. Um, great numbers and you've all <laughs> sat at the back, but that's okay. We'll get you in next time. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, my name is Laura. I work with Data Cove. You will see a few of us around. We're in our lovely lanyards. We've got Abby and Jeremy at the back here, but you don't have to worry about them because they code an R, like, you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Get that in straight away. Um, yeah, so obviously we're here for Python. Um, we are a community that meets about four times a year. Three, four, gosh, I think it's four. Uh, four times a year. So, you know, if this is your first time, welcome. And we hope to see your face again. But we do see some regulars and it's lovely to see you back, which is fantastic. So let's just go over what we're up to today. Um, this event is being recorded if you would rather not be on kind of um, the video on YouTube, or if you don't wanna be on socials, if you just let us know, and then we will make sure that you have a big pie sticker over your face or something. <laughs> um, so we work for Data Cove, we are your hosts for tonight. And just to give you a bit of an overview, um, we are a data and analytics company, and we support um, businesses to help understand and really get the most out of their data. So if you're interested, you can find us in all these places. Uh, feel free to come and chat with us at any point. We also do training. So if you wanted to do some pie training or God forbid, R training, <clears throat> yeah, we do some of those as well. So if you are trying to get into Python or if you have some friends who want to do it, um, you can find out more or come and chat to us as well. So we have um, some sessions that we do. Tonight though, what we're gonna do is, we've obviously had some refreshments, pizza and networking, um, but we're going to hear from our lovely speaker, Carl, and he's gonna be talking to us about greening the spark one line at a time, very exciting. And hopefully you've all had a little glance at the kind of exhibit over there. And I think you're gonna explain a lot more about that later, which is great. And um, we did have a second speaker, unfortunately, it was Paddy Osborne from Osman, sorry, from Zoe, and he sends his massive apologies because he is um, unwell with COVID, bless him. And he was going to try and even come on um, kind of online, but he's just not well enough. But he has said he will definitely come back another time. So we will, we will hold him to that and we will make sure because that would be wonderful to hear from him as well. So what we've got instead, we've got our lovely Abby at the back, who's going to kind of introduce some things for us. We're going to have Carl doing his Green in the Spark, and then I am going to launch a competition, which might get some juices flowing. I know. <laughs> and there's prizes. Oh, yeah, that's better. <laughs> um, at the end, we'll have some questions. Um, we'll kind of eat whatever food and drink whatever drink is left and just a little bit of chat. You can always head to the pub to keep the conversations going. Um, but yeah, hopefully you have a lovely evening. So we have Carl, we're gonna to come to him in a second. Um, but first of all, we're gonna have Andy from Eagle Labs. He's just gonna do a bit of housekeeping and let you know what Eagle Labs get up to. Thank you. Hello, welcome everyone to Barclays Eagle Labs. So just a bit of the boring stuff I have to go through with you guys to start with. So toilets through the door, down the stairs and just follow it around to the left and the toilet's just on the left hand side. If there is a fire alarm goes off, there, there is no test today, thank God. Um, but if there is, just follow me because I should be the first one out that door. <laughs> All right, we go over to the pub, the Joker pub, and we'll just sit there and drink and just wait for the firemen to do whatever they need to do. So that's the housekeeping done and dusted. What I'd just like to say is about Barclays Eagle Labs, we love supporting Data Cove. Um, with the bits and pieces they do here with us. It's always a pleasure to be able to hold these events here. Um, Barclays Eagle Labs, you know, we've got 38 sites across the country. Um, we are literally business incubators. So we are there to help support your business grow and scale. So if you're looking for mentoring, uh, business accelerator programs, you know, there is things that we have that are able to help and support you. If you feel that that's something you want to know a little bit more about, um, also here in Brighton, we also offer co-working as well. So really, really cheap rates as well. So if you fancy getting out from home, going somewhere different, trying us out, you know, just let me know. Um, I'm about today, so I'll be here. So come and grab me. Um, I've got a couple of cars with a QR code on as well. Well, there's a QR code on the big banner at the front. Scan it, get in contact, and let me see what I can do to help you move your business forward. And have a good evening. Thank you. 
Thank you, Andy. And we are so grateful for this space because it is absolutely wonderful. And obviously the staff are amazing. Um, another person that I'm gonna get up to chat in a second is our lovely Grace. And none of this would be possible without Silicon Brighton, our hosts, our sponsors, our wonderful event coordinators. Um, so I'm gonna get Grace up. Did you know you were coming up? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Grace is coming up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was just doing a camera, camera stuff. Sorry. Um, hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who already know me, great to see you again. For those of you who don't, I'm Grace and I run Silicon Brighton. And our purpose is to be the hosts of Brighton and Host Tech Sector. Um, so this is one of many uh, meetups that happen across the city. Uh, as you may be uh, guessing from the jokes and references, there might be an R1 as well. Um, <laughs> but there are about 30 groups all together uh, that happen. Uh, this is uh, just a bit of a snapshot to give you a variety of the depth and breadth of all the different stuff happening across the city that we support. They're all free to join. Uh, they all have drinks and pizza, should definitely be on the slide. Uh, they're all available to people of all levels. Uh, so whether you're um, in that particular industry or working in that skill set, or you want to learn a little bit more, you're thinking about career switching, uh, you just want to meet some people um, that are interested in something that you're interested in, um, then come along. Uh, and they're all hybrid. So this one's being uh, live streamed, as are all of them. And the idea uh, with all of this is really just to make these meetups, these events, this industry as accessible as possible for people uh, to come learn, meet new people um, and do all of that good stuff that happens with bringing people together in a room on or offline um, together. These are our wonderful supporters. Um, so your Spot Data Cove on there, um, which is run by Jeremy, Abby, Laura, and the team. Um, but this is the, the group of amazing local businesses who basically give us money um, every single month, as well as a lot of time, skills, and resources uh, in order to continue to make these events um, free for the people who come along. So a massive, massive thank you uh, to all of those businesses. Uh, but your community does need you. So um, if you're part of a, a, a business that might want to support um, or to us, um, or if you yourself maybe want to volunteer your time speaking, uh, taking a more active role in organizing um, an event, perhaps you know a, um, of, a, of a topic or a theme or someone who might, be, might want to be involved, uh, then come and have a chat to me or definitely tell your friends and colleagues about the good stuff that's happening um, across the Meetup community. These are our values. Um, I won't read them all out, um, but basically all the events that we um, just trying desperately to ignore my dog whining and moving at the front of the room. Um, <laughs> these are our values and basically all the all the meetups, the partners, the supporters um, and the attendees. Um, we, we like to think that they uh, all reflect our values. If for whatever reason you feel that that isn't the case, then please always come and speak to us. Follow us on socials, we're on uh, Twitter slash X, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, and TikTok. And this probably would be a save the, save the date for the end. We can come to the back to this. Ah, oh, here we go. I've just overdone the slides. There are more events coming up um, throughout the month. So just to give you an idea of um, the, uh, again, the breadth of them, we've got Sussex Data Science coming up next month, uh, next week, People Planet Pint, the R Meetup, No Booze. Yeah, there we go. Uh, that may or may not have been Jeremy, funnily enough. Uh, and also women in blockchain talks um, as well. So this is just a little bit of a snapshot of some of the stuff coming up on the, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and yeah, the save the date for um, the next event, but I'm sure Laura will close the show um, with that one. And if you haven't already joined our group, um, why ever not, please do and come and check out the other groups as well. And then join us on Slack so you can engage with us um, off, uh, online as well as in person in between these. And that's it, over to Laura, who's gonna hand over to Abby. Thank you very much, Grace. Thank you. Um, so before we get Abby, Grace has reminded me, we do have like a hashtag thing. Oh gosh, that was so cringe, I do apologize. Um, we do have socials. If you wanna 
post photographs on socials, feel free. You know, it'd be quite nice to kind of build up that community. We do have that Slack channel. At the moment, it's kind of a lot more, oh, this event is coming up and it's kind of information based, but we would love it to be where people actually like shared ideas and kind of things that were going on or ask questions and got help from each other. So it'd be awesome if we could build up that Slack community. Um, I can put that up again at the end for you if you didn't get that. But yeah, now I'm going to introduce uh, the lovely Abby, who's going to come and talk to us about Earl. Good evening, everybody. I must apologize because this is the first time I've ever held a microphone in my life. Yes, I'm in my mid-20s. I've never held a microphone before anyone asks. So before I even start this talk, I just want to ask, how many of you people have heard of Earl in this room? Can I have hands up? No? There's some confused faces, but that's a lot. Okay, that's interesting. So to quickly just introduce us, why is this not moving? Laura, I don't like your laptop. Obviously, we have all been introduced to Jeremy in the room. He's the man at the back that won't stop screaming about R, so he won't particularly <laughs> let us forget him. And obviously myself standing at the front and the wonderful Laura who hosts Brighton Pie. To just keep this really quick and brief, because Laura's already introduced who Data Cove are. We work across lots of different things in data and analyses, but our main streams of work are customer analytics, marketing analytics, and process automation. But we also do things like training and we run lots of communities as well. And I'm invariably going to forget one of them. So we have Bristol, Portsmouth, Birmingham, Manchester, London, and Brighton. Yeah? Thank you. That does deserve a round of applause because that was a lot. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and they're all here. Unfortunately for you guys, they are mainly our groups. And then we've just got Brighton Pie that tags along with it just because we've got Laura. <laughs> so we're just going to briefly introduce what Earl is. Laura's laughing because I showed her these size and I don't think she actually thought I was serious with what I've called them. <laughs> So what on earth am I even talking about for the people in the room who have not heard of Earl? Who's talking at it? Why am I forcing you all to come and spend more time with us? Obviously, because you love us, right? You love Data Cove. You want to be cool and you want to talk and submit abstracts. You have spare money and you have no idea what to do with it. Because that's something people experience, right? I've been told. <laughs> and you want tickets, <laughs> obviously. So what is Earl? This is Earl. Here is some wonderful... <laughs> Here are some wonderful photos from Earl previously with my fantastic boss looking like he was in a Zara commercial for that one. I'm sorry, Jeremy, I found it on the OneDrive last night and had to put it on there. <laughs> we don't need to hear it. It's OK. So Earl is a cross-sector conference for the business applications of R and Python. So we are really excited to be opening it up to the community this year. For a lot of you that have previously heard of it, you've probably heard of it because it's to do with R, right? But we're also bringing Python. So that's all of you we're expecting to see. So the first day is always workshops. So we have got some really exciting Python workshops too, and some R ones. There's a couple that I'm not allowed to announce just yet, but there's lots of exciting things to come. So the workshops will be on the 3rd of September and the general conference will be the 4th to the 5th of September. The general conference is held in the Grand Hotel and there will also be a wonderful evening event in the i360. So the workshops, as suggested, there is one really lovely one, Shiny for Python, which is hosted by Posit themselves, by the Director of Product Strategy. And I promise there is lots and lots of exciting things to come. So if you want to hear from that, you're just going to have to keep on listening to the talk until the end. So who on earth is talking at Earl? So we've got our first keynote speaker, which is Professor Andy Fields from the University of Sussex. He's written many award-winning R and statistics books. And to be quite honest, he's just a fantastic statistician and lecturer. At Halloween, he would always dress up in really odd costumes, aliens, zombies, wizards, the list goes on. He's fantastic. 
And we've also got Crystal Swift, who is the senior data scientist at the BBC. And we are so excited to hear her talk as well this year. She's spoken at Earl many times, but this is the first time that she's keynoted. And we've also got Hadley Wickham. I'm pretty sure most of you people probably know who he is, even if you do Python, because who doesn't? He's obviously the author of the Tidyverse and the chief scientist at Posit. So why should you attend? Oh, I mean, I've given you enough reasons, right? But, you know, it gives you access to a lot of people that are in senior positions. And there's, you know, some big companies that actually you may have heard of before that you'd like to network with. Any of them seem a bit familiar? Oh, there's many more, by the way. These are just some of the ones that I've selected. So if you would like to come and talk at Earl as well, stand alongside all of our wonderful keynotes. And if your abstract is um, if your abstract is accepted, you do get a free ticket to Earl, is all I'm saying. So please scan the QR code and just keep the abstract form. The closing date is the end of March, and you can submit a 30-minute or a 10-minute talk on R or Python or both if you're feeling diverse. So I'll leave that up for just two seconds while people are scanning things. Awesome. So like I said, obviously everyone has spare cash, right? Apparently, someone once said. Well, Come and sponsor L, come and get involved, because it sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Sponsorship starts as, as small as £199, and all of the things that you can sponsor are just on your left-hand side there. If you are interested in sponsorship, please come and find myself, Laura or Jeremy, floating around the room, um, or come and get a business card off the table and talk to us at any point that you would like to. We do have some other amazing sponsors as well that we must honor. So Posit are actually the people to thank for also taking you up the i360 for the evening event. And we've also got our platinum sponsor of Ascent. So why wouldn't you want your brand alongside these people? So if you would like to get a hold of some tickets, then the home of Earl is right there. So please scan this for any information. This will give you ticket announcements, speaker announcement, workshop updates, any general information. And right at the bottom of the web page, there is just a little form that you can fill out. And the tickets will be going on sale very soon. So you obviously want to hear it first, right? There's only a limited number is all I'm saying. I'll leave it there for a second. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. And we obviously expect to see every single one of you in the audience at Earl. Thank you, Abby. I think I want to go now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds quite good. Oh, yes. I, will. Oh, I think I'm going anyway. <laughs> I might even be talking. Who knows? Um, lovely. Thank you, Abby. So, if you're all right, Carl, we'll get you up now. I don't know which one you want here. The next slide, button is. <laughs> the next slide just just that arrow there. Um, but yeah, we've now got, there we go. Lovely, Carl. I don't know which one you want to show. Where's your slides at? Is this? Is it that one? It's in PowerPoint presentation, which oh, I opened earlier. But then, there yeah, we go. That's Ready? It. Yeah. That's okay, it. let's just share this. Interview mode. And then if you just, the next. That's it. And it's. The arrow. Sorry. The next arrow. I've got to do one thing. Do you need your notes? Because no. This good. No. Don't. What I need is it to be like. Lovely. That. Yeah, that's like that. Yeah, I don't need your notes. Yeah, cool. Okay. Awesome. Uh, uh, it's just these two, is it home and end? Just, yeah, end, yeah. Yeah, 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 great. Hello, well, uh, welcome to Green in the Spark. It's a project I've been working on for about three years now and uh, stopped working on it about six months ago, so I've completely forgotten everything I did. <laughs> um, so let's just move on then and just give you a rough idea of my background. Um, <clears throat> supposed to move, isn't it? Try that one didn't work. Ah, yeah, yeah, just press the next. 
Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yeah, a bit brief um, summary of my career. Um, I, after I got my physics degree, I spent three years working as a tractor driver in a factory on the farm in a, as a uh, hospital porter. And then after about three years of messing around, I finally got a job as an electronics technician. And that kind of set me on the course for my career. So then I did a master's in maths and then got recruited to British Aerospace, where I moved to Bristol and um, worked on Hipparchos um, star satellite. Um, <clears throat> then, without going into too much history, I worked on the, the Advanced Robotics Initiative for two years, and I was work package manager of the operations concept and computer system work packages, which was great. It was my first introduction to AI, and that was back in 1989. In the end of the 80s, I founded a leisure company, and we we got the license from Chatsworth Television to build commercial versions of the TV show, The Crystal Maze. And we built five in the UK, two in Japan and one in Dubai. And um, after eight years of that, we kind of ran out of money. And um, I started teaching English as a foreign language. How bad can, <laughs> how bad can things be? <laughs> um, but fortunately, I could always fall back on playing the piano in a pub. So I did that quite a lot in those days. Um, <clears throat> so yes, yeah, so Cyberdrome, we went into liquidation in 1998, and then I taught English for two years. And then I went back to Munich uh, to go back into space operations, which became my real career. Um, so as I was working on the test and training um, concepts for the European part of the space station, the Columbus module, and for 10 years, I was the system engineer for the simulator that we used for training flight controllers, ground controllers, and astronauts. And that was fun, meeting real astronauts. Um, so that I did for 10 years. And then I went on to the Galileo GPS program, did that for four years. And it was such a nightmare that I resigned and moved back to England and went to York. Didn't like it there, so I moved to Brighton. So I've been in Brighton now since for about six years, and I was looking for something to do. So I thought, well, I'd like to do something about climate change. I've got a background in electronics, mathematical modeling, programming, graphics, sound. Crystal Maze was a great learning place for stuff like that. And um, so I came up with the idea of Greening the Spark, which was basically a simulator of the national grid. Um, to try and raise awareness about um, <clears throat> about climate change and energy and green energy in particular. So let's see. Okay, right. So, so yeah, the the concept was born, and after many many hours in the pub, it started to crystallise into something a bit more definite. Um, <clears throat> so, I basically I created a hands-on model of a national grid. And it's, it's all about electricity generation, distribution, storage, and consumption. And as I just said, it's about promoting the awareness of electrical energy and the, fact it, the impact it can have on the environment. Um, <clears throat> I've developed it as a prototype for a museum exhibit, which can also be played as a game for kids and adults alike, certain point, and a teaching aid uh, for use in schools and universities. Right. Okay, um, just to give you some technical detail, um, I've developed models in Python, originally running on the PC. The target environment is Raspberry Pi 4B um, under Raspbian, and basically everything runs on the Raspberry Pi now, and I access it remotely on my PC, so I've actually got a, a quite a nice development environment. Um, I've written about 10,000 lines of code uh, that's actually stuff I've written, and that excludes all of the external libraries and stuff from the... Uh, I'll go into that later in the software architecture. Um, basically, the hardware is... There's, there, are con there are real physical control panels, like you would have in a National Grid Control Centre. Um, there's uh, visitor and staff control panels, which basically, if you're in a museum, you've got to administer the thing. You've got to be able to switch it on and off. You've got to be able to stop it when you want to stop it. And you've also got to be able to start a game, stop a game, and so on. I'll get to that later. 
Um, then there's a grid monitoring and control panel, which is my idea of a uh, sort of generalized national grid control system. Um, <clears throat> I've got dynamic representations of wind and solar farms. You'll see pictures of those later. Um, the wind farm actually is three model wind turbines and the solar farm is just a lamp shining down on a picture of a solar farm. I mean, what else do you need? Um, and then there's a themed landscape and signage that provides context and information which of which I have made a small mock-up at the back. I was hoping in a, in a real museum situation that will be much, much bigger. It'll have 3D models, full 3D models of nuclear power station and fossil fuels and so on. That's just a 2D thing just to give you an idea of what it is. Okay, so... Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the museum installation, not particularly interested in schools at the moment, um, although I think that has a lot of potential, so I'll crack on with that. Um, okay, so the things that um, I've included as what I call typical elements of a national electricity grid. We've got wind power, so there's a wind farm, solar power, solar farm, then fossil fuels. Um, it, this is a generic model, so it doesn't really matter whether it's gas or coal or oil or any combination of those. I can scale the whole thing, and it's great because, as you know, in Python, you've got classes, you can make different instantiations. At the moment, I've just got one. So there's just one wind farm, one solar power farm, one fossil fuels, one nuclear, and so on. And then for storage, I've got um, uh, battery storage, pumped hydroelectric, and then to control it all, there's this grid monitoring and control system. So moving on from there. Right, now the way this works is that um, <clears throat> there's a, a model of the weather and a model of the consumer demand, and these are predefined. So basically I have a, a CSV file which has um, three timelines in. One is for the sun, one's for the wind, one is for demand. And there are 25 samples which cover 24 hours. <laughs> And that, that is what I call the basis timeline for each of these different um, uh, um, things. Um, the I actually use them in practice is use the baseline timeline and then I add Fourier components to it, which are randomized. And then I add something else, which I call bursts, which I'll explain in a minute. And so basically I create a series of timelines which corresponds to the actual weather and another series which correspond to predicted weather. And they have different randomized components, so they vary. And that's great because it always means that the predicted weather isn't quite the same as the weather that you actually experience. So there's sort of nice little level, degree of sort of realism in there. Um, <clears throat> because there's only 25 samples for a 24 hour period, it means basically you've got one sample per hour, which means that the actual weather pattern and the demand are varying very slowly. Well, it's really boring if you're in, in the museum and it's running in exhibition mode, which is real time. And the weather is all varying very slow. You're not going to be there for six hours to see how much the sun has changed or so on. So I added a random component, which I call bursts. So with the wind, you get gusts of wind. With the sun, you get clouds. And with the consumer demand, you get a surge. And these are all short-term events of the order of 10 seconds, 10, 20 seconds, tens of seconds. Um, and they're also completely randomized. And I'll explain them later on in more detail. Uh, as I said, forecasts are provided as well for each scenario. And these differ from the actual one because they're generated using random components. So those are the what I call the static models. They're predefined. We also have um, what I call dynamic models, which are fossil fuels and nuclear. And these are completely separate um, software models, if you like, and they're controllable. They're fully controllable. Um, but most of the time I've written a, I've written a grid management system, which I call non-renewables management system. And what they do is they respond to the weather and the demand and make up as much difference as they can by controlling the amount of nuclear and fossil fuels. Um, and that's automatic and it's also manual. Um, in the game, you control it yourself. 
when it's in exhibit mode, it runs automatically and it just creates, you know, a, a real time simulation. Um, the storage elements are batteries and hydro, pumped hydro. Um, <clears throat> these are also, these are actually completely autonomous and I've written a storage management system that handles basically, it's the differences. You've, you start off with the, the renewables, then you make up as much difference as you can using the non-renewables. And then you're using, back, you're using storage to store and retrieve and store and retrieve, depending on to try and keep the balance. And that, that works really well. You can see when it's actually running that it's completely stable over a whole 24 hour period, um, unless you have a catastrophic failure of one of the things like no wind and no sun at the same time for the whole day. So anyway, so uh, overall management of the grid is provided by a grid monitoring control system. And I base that on spacecraft monitoring and control, um, which I'll go into in more detail in a minute. Right, so this is just gives you a bit of context. Um, here you've got the non-renewables, here you've got the renewables and the demand. You've got the storage stuff here. Now the blue lines here, represent raw electrical power which goes across the you know the high voltage lines and through the transformers and all that kind of stuff the red lines these are all control so that's basically telecommand and telemetry and that's going backwards and forwards that the, the, these elements here are continuously sending telemetry to the monitoring control system the monitoring control system uses its control laws and everything else that it's got access to I can't actually see it now um, yeah, so we've got an operator interface where the operator is able to actively monitor and control things. And then you've got the storage management system, non-renewables and weather and demand forecasting, which I've explained earlier. Anyway, that's how it all fits together, more or less. So then, right, so this is a bit more detail about the monitoring and control system. Um, uh, yes, so you receive telemetry from each of the things in the grid uh, containing power, energy and status information. Uh, operator interface is for, for interfacing with the monitoring control system. And then there's grid control laws which determine how power is allocated to and from the grid. So I've explained all this already. Then there's a telecommand system for transmitting control information back to each element. And then so a bit of housekeeping, calculation of derived data such as cumulative energy, utilization, CO2 footprint, costs, etc. And then it creates a lot of other information that can be used um, uh, for, for further reporting, further inspection, analysis and games results, that sort of thing. So then this is an example of a 24 hour scenario. Um, <clears throat> This is the, basically, you've got, um, uh, hang on a minute, I'm just putting my glasses on. Uh, yeah, it's difficult to read, isn't it? Um, you've got the green one is demand, and you can see that goes up at breakfast time, and it's sort of level during the day, then it goes up in the evening when everybody's cooking supper and watching EastEnders or whatever they're doing. And all the different things going up and down. The sun, the solar power, obviously there's none at night, the red one. Um, you get sort of maximum around about midday and so on. So you get the idea. These are the timelines that actually run for that particular session. And then this is how the storage elements react. And they're going up and down all the time to try and keep the supply constant. And um, when, as I said, when that's under autonomous control, that all works very well. So then, so this is my wind and solar farm. This is in my flat. So it's a good job I'm single, um, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I have uh, basically a lamp with three very bright LED arrays in, and uh, that shines on a picture of the solar, solar array. And I've got model wind turbines which actually work. Um, so those are what I call representations because they're representations of, of things that actually work. Then this is the mock-up which I've got over here, which shows you all of the basic elements that I would like to have in a museum installation. So you've got something like this with hopefully 3D models of everything. 
Um, and everything I've discussed already is there somewhere. And the important thing is the two panels now, which you haven't seen, which is the visitor control panel here and the uh, operator control panel there. And then there's a bit of signage and stuff to explain things. <clears throat> Oops, hold on. Yeah, All right. So the experience, what actually happens? Um, okay, well, let's look at the exhibit, the visitor experience. Um, most of the time it's running in exhibition mode. And if there's nobody there, what you don't want to do is to wear out the wind turbines because they, they're not going to last forever. So if there's nobody there, I've got infrared sensor that can detect that there's nobody there. So they all switch off. And then when somebody comes in, suddenly everything kicks into action. The lights come on, the wind turbines start going, and you start getting caustic messages. Um, so uh, it then starts running in, in normal real-time mode. Um, then you can, um, you can enjoy that for a bit, and then you get the chance of playing it as a game. So basically you get um, 24 hours of game time in five minutes, which is the equivalent of 288 times real time, fast forward. Uh, otherwise, people are just going to get bored. I mean, I could have a 24-hour game, but I don't think anyone would want to play it. <laughs> um, yeah, so you get, I've actually got um, three difficulty levels, and I'll explain about those later, but uh, if you play it at, at the easy level, your game is five minutes, if you play it at a medium level, it's seven and a half, and if you play it difficult, it's ten minutes, so it's, and a lot more challenging as well. Okay, um, <clears throat> I've invented a concept of sparks, because this is all about electricity, and I've got, I'll, I'll explain the details later, but sparks are your way of getting a score for how well you've done. Okay, so I'll go into that in a bit. And then something that brought, the, I only introduced audio about a year ago, and boy, was that a headache, but it has made a big difference. It's actually brought the whole thing alive. So now I've got sound effects that correspond to certain events, like, for example, if you've got a power shortfall over the grid, you get a klaxon sounding. If you've got uh, a surplus, you get a bell sounding. Uh, there's background sounds, there's ambient sound effects for the control room, ambient sound effects for the game, um, which I call background soundscape. And I've also used three characters. Um, so I invented the idea of uh, a system character who actually is the system talking to you. The monitoring control system has a personality and it talks to you in a sort of robotic English voice, which I created. And then there are two guides, um, which I should have gone about, later, but there's two guides. One's an Aussie and one's an Indian woman, and they're very different. And they kind of, you know, argue a little bit with each other and take the piss. Um, <laughs> Um, the staff experience, this is something that if you're, gonna, if you're actually running a museum, you want to know what's, what it's all about, what you have to do on a daily basis. Um, they have the wherewithal to switch things on and off and so on. And you can access the Raspberry Pi via laptop. Uh, so this is the visitor control panel. And um, it's actually, the, it, because this is only a prototype. I've actually put them together, but you've got visitor control panel and the staff control panel will normally be separate and uh, visitors will not have access to this, so they can't accidentally switch it off or stop it or start it. So that's separate and all the game controls and stuff are here, are here. So you've got the game, you can, you can press play, then you choose your level of difficulty and then you start the game. And then when you're finished, you get three sparks. So they're either red, green, or blue. And the sparks are for um, efficiency, economy, and eco-friendliness. And those are all calculated with all the cumulative data from the run. And you'll see that in action in a minute, because I've got some videos. Um, just going back, just going to some hardware, the um, interface boards that I built for the visitor control panel, this is one of them. And this uses an Adafruit 16-pin GPIO expander. And all the push buttons and bits and bobs um, <clears throat> basically run off those. And there are two of those inside the, um, 
visitor control panel. And that's what they look like when it's built. Um, so two of those crammed into a tiny little box. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it took a while to get working, I can tell you. Um, right, so this is the main monitoring and control panel. And you've got uh, what I call a numeric header at the top, which shows you the time on the left, then the mains frequency. I've even modeled variation in mains frequency depending on, on demand and so on. So if, if there's a shortfall, then the frequency drops. If there's a surplus, the frequency goes up. Uh, the model's a bit of a cheat, really, because it's a kind of, oh, how about this? Um, so it's not based on any real physics, but it, it looks convincing. Um, and then you've got um, the cumulative amount of CO2 that you've produced in this run and the cost in millions of pounds. So the CO2 is in, actual, is in tons, cost is in millions of pounds. Um, then you've got, uh, there's actually a switch here and you can toggle that. And when you toggle it down, you get the proportions of wind, solar, fossil fuels, and nuclear that have been used uh, to date. So you get a rough idea of the mix that you've been creating. So you can, you can start to estimate, is this a clean one or is this a cheap one? Um, <clears throat> so then you've got the, the, um, the gauges. So you've got indicators for all the various um, generators and the demand. Um, <clears throat> And then down here, this is the control knobs. So you can use these to control fossil fuels and nuclear directly. And then you've got the status uh, panel, which gives you the status of the storage batteries and hydro. You can see it's like a normal battery status indicator. And then you've got shortfall, nominal and surplus, and they will light depending on, on what's happening. Um, you'll see that working on the, on the video. Um, and then each gauge has two. It's got actual and forecast. So you've got the two lots working. The forecast one actually is differential. It doesn't tell you what the weather's going to be. It tells you how it's going to change over the next hour or so. And that gives you a slightly better indication. Um, so, okay, next. Oh, that's the back of the control panel, just so you can see it's real. <laughs> I call that the rat's nest. <laughs> Okay, difficulty levels. Um, well, in game mode, well, there are three, as I've already said. And how they work is that um, the more difficult, the, the higher the difficulty level you choose, it means that the, the, these, these static models are more volatile. So you get much higher variation in um, wind, sun, and, and consumer demand. So they become more erratic. The forecasts become increasingly inaccurate. And the storage capacity and power are reduced, making balancing the grid much more difficult. And so it's, it's quite a challenge to keep that going um, and keeping the, the, the grid well balanced. OK, so now for some entertainment. Um, if I can find. Um, don't seem to have access to the rest of the That's desktop. Escape. escape, OK. All right. And uh, that's not the one I want. Hang on, I've got to go. Yeah. So this is what happens when a member of the museum staff comes in and they want to start it up. So basically tip, type F5. <laughs> Systems now initializing. This will only take a few seconds. Systems now fully operational. Going into exhibit mode. Okay, so now it's running. And it'll now run all day as a real-time simulator. So that's basically start up. Then, uh, shut up. This is the game. 
abbreviated version. Pressing the start button or the play button and choosing a level of difficulty. And Good pressing choice. Key. Even easy level can be quite difficult. Have a look at the monitoring and control panel. Notice the clock on the top left where it says time. This will fast forward through 24 hours in just a few minutes, so keep an eye on it. The game will finish at midnight. There are four sources of electric power, wind, solar, fossil fuels and nuclear. Wind and solar are dependent on the weather, but you can control the fossil fuels and nuclear power using the two control knobs. Consumer demand is shown on the top right dial. Batteries and pumped hydro levels are shown by the bar graphs on the bottom right. And the overall grid status is shown by the short pause, nominal and surplus lights. Try to balance the supply with the demand and keep the grid status nominal. We will start now. See how many things fast you can get. Let's go. Game No, the phones and the office noises. So you survive the game. Look at the control panel and explain the here. Two blue sparks and one green one. This is looking pretty good. Let's check out the active sparks. You want you got a blue spark for economy. That means the electricity was reasonable and was a good balance between fossil fuels and nuclear. You got a blue spark for eco friendliness. That means the carbon footprint was reasonable due to there being plenty of renewables and nuclear power available. You can also see your results online. Scan the QR code and put in the game number. See you next time. And it will carry on till the next people come along. Then um, we'll do the shot. <laughs> um, okay, so it's five o'clock now. Time to go home. Um, so basically, shut down. Thank you for helping to read the spot today and see you next time. Commencing shutdown in five seconds. Goodbye. <laughs> That's it. Great. Okay. Now, sorry, right. I'm afraid it's not the end of the talk. That's a halfway point. <laughs> so if you want to go to the loo now, feel free. Um, okay. Right. So we get back to the presentation now. Next slide. 
uh, yeah, reporting. There's a huge amount of stuff about reporting because I report at various different levels. Um, hello? Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. You want to get back to full view? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. So this 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 actually this slide actually only refers to the results, the game results reporting, um, which Ben knows all about. <laughs> um, so at each game you get a load of summary data. Uh, which I won't go through all that, but sort of interesting stuff about your general utilization, for example, how much nuclear power, how much time did you actually use the nuclear power for? Do you actually need a nuclear power station for this? Is this just you know and you can look at all sorts of things like that. So, and, and also the utilization of fossil fuels, total energy you generated, used and stored, blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> then it gives you the scores, as you saw with the sparks for efficiency, eco friendliness, and economy. Uh, it also has comments. And the great thing is, I can edit the comments so I can make them as nice or nasty as I want. Um, I've actually, from Crystal May's experience, I, I'm being a bit careful. Um, one story actually from the crystal maze in Blackpool. Uh, we had two files. Um, you chose when you checked in. You you had to choose a team name, and we had to have a list of words that you weren't allowed to use as team names, which, as you can imagine, were all swear words. And then we had a list of default team na team names, and somebody swapped the two files. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that was interesting. Anyway, um, so yeah, where was I? Yeah, so you get sparks and and comments and so on, and then you get the timeline plots at the end, so you can see exactly how everything went. And um, as I said, the information there is actually stored in three places. Um, there's a local file, uh, there's uh, the screen on the remote PC, and also in the online database. Um, which was created and maintained by Ben here. Thank you very much. And so let's move on. It's gone dead again. Now it will work. Ah, great. Thank you. Great. Yeah. So this is an example of an online re report now. So you get the summary data in this um, table here and you get some comments too. Excellent, excellent, excellent. OK, OK. There aren't any bad ones. I won't say what that says. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's the results. And then you can see I've divided the this lot into three different things. There's things that you'd have no control over which is the, um, the scenario, the weather and the consumer demand, that's a given. Then these are the th things that you did to control things. So I call these the controlled sources. So that's nuclear and fossil fuels. And then this shows how the grid has performed as a result of what you've done. So you've got the whole picture there. Um, so you can understand your scores a bit better. Okay. All right, so uh, that's the sort of general overview. So let's have a look a little bit at the software. Um, so we go here. Uh, this is the software architecture. And basically, at the very top, you've got the main SIM application, which is the thing that runs the whole show. And then you've got calibration and test programs. And these have access to every module beneath them. And there's a definite hierarchy here. And then at the bottom, the very bottom, you've got the system, the operating system. Then you've got third-party libraries. So you've got all the hardware libraries, Redboard, Adafruit, the I2C bus controller. And then you've got the Python libraries down there as well. Um, so I've written everything above this level. So all of that is what I've written. Um, <clears throat> then just going down slowly, you've got the actual the grid model, the static models, dynamic models, and so on. These are the model level. Then you've got the two control panels and the representations, the wind farm and solar farm. Then you've got device dependent device drivers. So there's ones for the Raspberry Pi here. And then these are stubs that I use on the PC so that I can do a certain amount of development there. 
Then you've got reports, management, data files, utilities, maths, and logbook. Um, basically gives you a whole ecosystem of software uh, function functionality. Um, all right. Just to give you an idea of the complexity, um, the main sim has uh, an outer loop, which is called run GTS. First of all, it runs a hardware test. It won't run if the, if the hardware is not up to it. So it does that first. And then it goes into a sort of big loop. Um, and it only does that when you start it, it immediately goes into exhibition, exhibit mode. So it'll, by default, it'll go this way into exhibit mode. And it'll stay in exhibit mode until you press the game button and start to play the game. And then it will run in game mode. Um, once you in one of these modes, um, you, you've got the simulator control. So you're initializing the sim and actually running the sim. And then the sim itself is just a continuous loop of updating the models. And you do them in this order, static, dynamic, storage, and grid. And that keeps the information flow all consistent and um, moving nicely around and around. But the main thing to realize is that 99% of the time, it's going around in this loop, either in exhibit mode or game mode. I used to have a test mode, but I've abandoned it now because I can't be asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, this just gives you an idea of how time is handled. Um, you've got uh, you've got sim time, which is as 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 well with real time. Real time. This is the real world. This time is real seconds, and so on and so forth. And the the loops run in the cycle in what I call frames. So each loop runs a frame. And for example. It runs three frames consecutively. So the first one, it'll update the models and read the fossil fuels control. Then it'll update the models and read the nuclear control. Then it'll update the models and then update the panels and then repeat. And the reason for that is because of uh, whoops, performance limitations. Um, it takes 120 milliseconds to read an ADC, which I think is ridiculous. Um, it's got two ADCs to read. So uh, what I've had to do is I had to stagger it so that it reads one at a time in each cycle. And that means I can then run the whole thing at six hertz, which is perfectly OK for this. Um, um, so that's how the thing works in real time. You've got basically, yeah. And then the sim time is the time that you're pretending it is in the simulator. So for example, when you're running the game, you're running 24 hours in five minutes. So that's running at 288 times real time. Uh, this picture is difficulty level hard, and the time factor is 144, so it runs for 10 minutes. Um, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, and the cycle interval, everything's adjusted there because it's all pretend time up there. Right. Mm. Um, I was going to explain about bursts. Um, this idea was because, um, as I said earlier, things change too slowly, and this is to create a bit of liveliness to it. And also, young, you know, the younger you are, children especially, you get really bored if everything doesn't happen in nanoseconds. Um, so I've created something that's based on the, the, MIDI, the MIDI note idea. So it's basically got attack, sustain, release. It hasn't got the, um, it's not the full MIDI, obviously, because it doesn't go, it doesn't go up there and down again. Um, and it's also linear, not exponential. But it does the job. And it creates, yeah, it, it, it works really well. You get all sorts of, you know, little clouds going over and, and so on. Um, um, and this, this runs in exhibit mode. <coughs> So a nice little feature. That's one of the most recent things I've added, actually. Um, OK. Um, I created a whole suite of software to deal with um, loop iteration. Because as I said, the whole thing runs round and round and round 6 hertz. And I needed a load of control functions for, for, for running in a looping thing. And um, the most important one is transition. Um, this detects when something changes and only when it changes. And then its response is determined by how you set it up. So when you initialize 
and in, when you in, initialize a new instance of a transition, you set up its parameters to behave in the way that you want. So for example, you can say, when I detect the infrared sensor, somebody's come into the room, what do I do? Well, the first thing I do, for example, is to initiate a playlist which responds to the person coming in the room and they will say something. And then there's a delay one, for example, so when they come in, I want to switch on the wind turbine and the solar farm, uh, but let's wait 15 seconds for that. So you can set delays and things so that you can respond to events uh, in you know later when you feel like it um, and there's also a lock mechanism as well so for example if you if you're generating a surplus and then not a surplus and then a surplus then not a surplus you don't want it reacting every time it changes you want it to say well okay it's in surplus for now but I'm gonna ignore it for the next two minutes um, and otherwise the thing becomes unstable and you're reacting to things all the time, especially when it's, uh, you know, on the edge or something and it's going in and out very rapidly. Um, right, there's a timer, just like a normal stopwatch thing. You can set run and stop. Then the scheduler comes in very useful. Um, I use that for scheduling bursts and various other things. Um, you can set the scheduler with a tuple of times, so you can run a whole load of predefined times, or you can set it to a fixed interval, run definitely, and you can set random repeat, so bursts use the random repeat. So the time, and you, set the, you set the upper and lower limits of the random numbers. Then the cycler, you've already seen that in operation, um, for cyclical function calls. So for calling the ADC, um, reading the analog to digital, uh, analog to digital um, pots, um, <clears throat> it cycles them one at a time so that you've got three different parts in the cycle that they get uh, called for. Toggler, that's pretty obvious. You just toggle on and off, left and right, and so on. Interlock, that's a bit more complicated actually, and I don't want to spend too much time talking about that because I not fully understanding it myself. Um, but it's very clever, I can show you. And um, what it does is it, it manages resources um, that, that there is a competition for. So for example, with the wind turbines and the solar, um, you switch the wind turbines on when someone comes in the room, but you also switch it on if you twiddle one of the knobs, yeah? And each of those is entitled to switch it off again after a certain delay. But if you've done one and then the other, you don't want them interfering with each other. And so what this does is it combines the two things. And effectively, you have two overlapping pulses. And it can be an and or an or operation. And it works very well for, as I said, managing things when there's a conflict. In particular, you don't want, um, you don't want sound files being triggered at the same time when they're for different things, that sort of thing. Um, sampler, that's a way of reducing the amount of data produced because there's data produced six, the, the entire state vector is recalculated six times a second and you don't want to store all that data. So what sampler does is it says, well, okay, let's, um, let's look at 10 minute samples rather than one sixth of a second and just crunch it all down and basically just takes the average. Um, it's no more sophisticated than that. Bursts I've already talked about. Um, so th these are all the special functions that I've created for iterations. All right, audio. Yeah, this was a lot of, it was quite difficult actually, because um, I've explained who they are and you've heard them already. Um, but basically, I have an access database which takes care of the 152 audio files, playlists, and so on. And it actually produces um, the Python code for declaring all of those things. So I can copy and paste it straight into the Python program, uh, which saves an awful lot of time. And um, then the Python, the, the, the audio module, then compiles the lists into a dictionary format that it can deal with. And then the, the sort of, uh, so it's, it's largely, the whole process is pretty well automated. Um, now, the way it works is you can, there are three different ways of playing sound files. 
It can be sequential, which basically means I'll play a sound file and everything stops and waits for the sound file because that's in sequence. Um, that's fine if you're explaining how the game works, but it's not fine if the game is already running and you want something to happen. You don't just suddenly stop so you've got the klaxon going and then start again. So the next one is um, sound files can be queued. Uh, so they're stuck in a queue and played in parallel with the program thread. And then there's a service, uh, a service function which basically picks off the ones that are next and plays them and goes through the playlist until it's finished or, or stopped for whatever reason. And then there's um, the third mode, which is ambient mode, which I use um, for the backgrounds. So uh, in the game, you've got this sort of background music sound, which plays con constantly throughout the game. And in, um, and in uh, exhibition mode, you've also got a background sound that plays all the time. So that's the three ways that works. Um, I don't need to explain how queue handling works. Um, to say also that I support multi-version playlists, and that gives you, um, again, you can say, like you, you can have a specific version, make it cyclical or random. And this is great. So, um, it means that with the guides, for example, each of them has their own way of explaining things. So one time you can get her to explain it, the next time you can get him to explain it. Uh, uh, and there are, it just gives you a lot more versatility and also randomness, which is good. Um, so all the speech synthesis, I've used Google Cloud services, text-to-speech, and sound effects mostly from free sound, but I've got quite a big library of my own because I do music and stuff. Um, and yeah, I do the processing at Ableton, which is where the robotic voice comes from, and um, do a bit of post-processing in Goldwave. Right. Okay, so that's the bones of what we've got so far. So talking about the future, and probably this is relevant to this place, funding. Hello. Um, this is supposed to be actually going into museums all over the world, um, but unfortunately I need funding. I need teaming up with an established exhibit design and installation team. I need to find a target venue to host it. And to be honest, I haven't had much luck so far. I'm not really a marketing type of person, but there we go. So I'm just saying there's a great marketing opportunity here for someone who likes the challenge and is willing to put more money in than they get out. Great. So <laughs> you were talking about people who had more money than they knew what to do with? <laughs> yeah. Well, they say I've got more money than sense, but if, I, if that were true, I would be incredibly clever. Um, um, so... I'm, um, yes, uh, la, 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 la. yeah, so philanthropists, yeah, go wherever they are, do come. Um, anyone who wants to actually see it working, you're welcome to come around to my flat. I live near the I-360, and um, yeah, it takes about 40 minutes to run through a game and an explanation and so on and so forth. So, you know, if you want to come around, do. Um, yeah, ideas for the future. Well, control panels in software rather than hardware, and you can run them remotely. AI-driven grid management, I'd love to do that. I've just done an AI course, and I'm kind of wondering how I'm going to actually do this. Um, better data visualization, yeah, well, you know, we all want that. Um, modular hardware for expansion of control panels. I've got, I'd love to have the whole wall covered with dials and knobs, um, and then, to live stream real national grid data, that would be quite nice too. That's possible. I've spoken to Rampian people about that. They, they, they can do that. Schools and universities, mind about that. Oops. Um, okay, so there's two websites. There's the website, which I started about two years ago. And then there's Ben's website, which has the online results. So if you want to, to scan those. <laughs> Whose fault's that? <laughs> okay, so are we done. Yeah, and then finally, I've actually been published in two magazines. So, uh, um, they're both Raspberry Pi magazines, so it sort of limits the scope slightly. But I have a six-page spread in Hackspace and two-page interview in Magpie. So there you go. That's it.
Ja. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, 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 right. Stay there a second, because we will we will have some questions okay. if you're open for it. Um, guys, I don't know about you, but that was incredible. That was just another round of applause. That was amazing. Um, way beyond what you explained to me earlier. So um, yeah, very, very impressive. Um, I also want to know about your life. I think we just need to go for a drink sometime, definitely. Um, I'm very excited to hear more. But yes, we will do some questions. Uh, our lovely assistant here, model that he is, <laughs> is going to come around and deliver those. So you okay doing some answers? Fabulous. Well, <laughs> I am going to limit this to 10 minutes, people, just because we do want to get out of here and possibly go to the pub afterwards. Okay? <laughs> Oh, I apologise. I wasn't speaking loudly enough. Um, thank you very much for the Pleasure. wonderful talk. Um, I've, I've actually got two questions, but my first question will be, have you got any plans to make this open source? Yes. Cool. That's on the school's page, which I didn't read out. Oh. Um, it says, basically, go. if you want to make a school project out of it, you can have the code open source and, and you can have all the blueprints. You can have all the blueprints for the hardware. Hmm. Okay, and my other question was just very quick, sorry about this, um, was have you thought about making an online version? I know you yes. put the information there, but yes. it'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, I have thought about it, yeah. as far as it's got. But I was going to say, that might segue nicely into the yeah, open well, source. Yeah, yeah, I'm making music now, it's sort of like I've moved on a little bit, but if someone comes back to me and says, yeah, we'd love to do an online version, here's 250k, you know, I'm your man. Thank you, Cole. Okay. Um, if people come to play this game in a museum, what sort of impression or message would you like them to go away with? Um, I'd like them to go away with the fact that um, electricity comes in different forms and different cost and different impact to the environment. And how you choose to that is up to you. If you're a business manager with a very tight budget, you might do one thing. If you're a, you know, an altruistic person who wants to save the world, you would do it differently. I just want people to be aware that there are options. Um, other question is, uh, why did you choose Python as your programming language of choice? Um, it's a good question, actually. Uh, it was all the rage then. <laughs> um, I've, I've done Pascal and Fortran, God help us, and um, C and C++, double plus, and Python seemed like a nice new start. And the best thing about it was that I found this amazing uh, online tutorial thing called Real Python. I don't know if anybody knows about that. And I, I, I went through a whole load of their courses before I started actually doing any coding. And I thought they were brilliant. I thought Python is a nice language. It's got lots of constructs that I enjoy. It's got classes and data classes and all sorts of things that I like to use. And um, it, it, yeah, it just seemed like a good idea at the time and I haven't changed my mind. Because I don't know R. <laughs> <laughs> from my elbow okay, thank you <laughs> any more questions Stunned Guys, I'll ask a question because otherwise I am going to ask a question so. uh, hello uh, very nice uh, to talk thank you very much um, if you can talk about like how the fossil fuel and the nuclear work together in terms of response time. I assume if you can you can't turn a nuclear no. station on instantly, no. so there's a latency to both. Yeah. I assume that's modeled. That's one of these just talk They about. are modeled differently. Yeah. The the coal the fossil fuels one has a rise time of about five minutes and the nuclear has one of about half an hour. Um, so when it's working you don't see that though, you see, because the the, the non renewables the non renewables management system does it almost seem you can't tell. It's almost seamless. If you're doing things manually, you will notice the difference uh, because the f adjustments are so fine. They're happening at six times a second. So you don't see, as soon as it deviates the slightest bit, it comes back on and you just don't see that. Um, but um, in real time mode, yeah, it takes half an hour for the nuclear thing to ramp up. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Am I allowed one more? Okay. Just quick point. Um, have you thought about speaking at PyCon? PyCon UK. No, I hate public speaking. Oh, okay. <laughs> I could I could tell. <laughs> I'm useless at it. <laughs> but I'll, I'll I'll talk to you about that later. Maybe. <laughs> A question at the back here, apparently. Oh, right yeah. at the back. So, I mean, I'd love all the background noises and the sort of immersive thing of it. I've worked on some immersive theatre type showy things as well, probably a bit like your Crystal Maze, Maze thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how do you find it with, I, I think it's a great concept, but to engage kids, I think there's a lot more. Uh, tutoring that needs to go on about what's going on there for them there's a lot of great modeling you've done there that yeah it's fantastic and yeah you almost want to do it with the real live data as a sort of static piece almost because i don't quite know what i'm trying to say sorry it's yeah it's very complex what's going on yeah. and it makes it hard to gamify as a well, zippy yeah. zippy game well, as well what you haven't seen and what i didn't make a video of is uh the explanations that you get when the system starts up again so when you come in it addresses you and explains everything in detail um, it's also explained on signage there and there's also um, an online visitor center which i've created which you can look at and that again explains everything and then there's my project website which explains everything at the sort of user level and then there's a tech page which explains how all the technology works so there's so many different levels that you can go in at and if you're a child you'll just walk into a museum the thing will respond to you, you go, ah, ah, and things will start whirring around and then these two guys will start explaining it all to you and if you're five you won't understand a word of it and you won't care you'll just twiddle the knobs uh, if you're 10 you'll probably go oh that's interesting and if you're an adult you'll just go wow and uh have you, have you not approached the Rampion Visitor Centre yes, on your doorstep? Yeah, uh, yes, I offered to give them a demonstration. And as soon as they realised it wasn't something I wanted to put into the Rampion Visitor Centre, they said, sorry, I haven't got time. Why didn't you want to? Put it in there. Um, As a proof of concept and um, showing it yeah, in operation. Yeah, I might, I might, but it, it, they just didn't seem that interested to be honest. I mean, I went to a talk at the Café Scientifique given by two of their engineers, and they gave a brilliant talk about Rampion Wind Farm. And I went up to them afterwards and I talked about it and they got very enthusiastic about greening the spark. But as soon as it went up to management, all that interest went. Shame. I did, but they don't have the power. I've also written to, um, what's it called, RWI or the, the massive global energy company, German energy company. They've got wind farms and things all over the world. I've written to them twice, not a dicky bird back, nothing. Nobody I've written to has, has, has shown any interest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> an idea. Great. Any more questions from the audience? Have we got any questions online? Are you online with a question? I think we're done. I'll hand back to Laura. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. That was absolutely amazing. Right. There is only one more thing I would actually like to talk about, and then I will let you go, I promise. Um, let's see where it is. Oh, that's the wrong one. That's us. Bit of a loop. Right. Here we go. So we have a chance. How do I make this a bit better? Ooh. There we go. Um, we have a chance. We have an opportunity uh, to make a new logo for Brighton Pie. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's fine as it is. It's just very green. And I love green, obviously. But, you know, it could be a little bit more exciting. So we are launching a competition tonight. You are the first people to hear about it um, to get a new logo. Now, 
if you do code in R, they obviously have loads of packages and he oh, right, yeah, yeah. hexes are a real big thing in some other languages. So to kind of, because we do loads of other R uh, events and communities, we thought it might be quite nice to have something then we could also stick alongside our hexes. Um, so we have this idea that we'd like to make a Brighton Pi hex and just to kind of, you know, have a sticker that you can put on your laptop or whatever, um, or your water bottle. So if anyone would like to get involved in that, um, that would be amazing. We'd like for you to give that a go. We're going to give you up to a month before the next pie. So we'd like to announce the winner at the next pie, which would be amazing. Um, closing date would be the 9th of April. There are some guidelines. It must be in hex format. So it's in this kind of shape and that's a 44 by 50 mils. Um, it must say Brighton Pi, because otherwise it's a bit pointless. I'd quite like to still have the Python in it somehow, but, you know, creative differences, we'll leave that up to you guys. Um, it will be printed out as a sticker, and it'll need to kind of, well, Abby said it needs to fit with her others. I don't think it has to. She's given me, oh, okay. <laughs> I think you can be as creative as you want. We're Pi, we're different, but we'll find about that later. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, so that would be really, really amazing. Um, and as you see there at the top, if you are chosen to be our new logo, not only do you get a bottle of booze or something of your choice of deliciousness, you also are in for a one day free ticket to Earl, which is like, woo, amazing. So yeah, that'd be really, really cool. Um, so yeah, either I'll stick all this on our meetup so you have all the details, I'll stick it on the Slack, I'll put it on LinkedIn, I'll put it everywhere we, R. Um, not that R. And, <laughs> but if you'd like to get involved, that'd be amazing. So if any of you are like super creative, we would love to see your, um, your attempts at a new logo because ours are really bad. Hence why we've had to get someone else to do it. <laughs> but yeah, thank you ever so much for your time tonight. I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you next time. Oh, sorry, pub. Yeah, feel free to go to the Joker afterwards. That's where apparently the cool kids are all going. Yeah, <laughs> boss. <laughs> what was it? Oh, is there anyone driving back?